Good afternoon. I'm uh, Jim Bauman. I'm the managing editor of the Daily Herald. Uh, today is September 9th, 2020, and I'm pleased to begin a joint interview with candidates for the 14th Congressional District in the November 2020 election. I'm joined by a Daily Herald reporter, Russell LaSalle, and uh, Daily Herald editorial board members, John Lampinen, Jim Slusher, Diane Dungy, Pete Nenny, Lisa Miner, and Robert Sanchez. Also with us today is uh, John Stife and John Etheridge from Shaw Media. Uh, they represent their editorial board. We uh, are doing this jointly to save us some time and to save you some time as well, but we'll be forming our own opinions and publishing our own editorials on this. Anyway, we welcome the candidates, uh, incumbent Democrat Lauren Underwood and Republican challenger Jim Oberweiss, who's a member of the Illinois State Senate. Uh, Representative Underwood, we'll start the questioning with you. Do you view this election as a, re as a referendum on President Trump? Well, thank you for having me today. I'm really delighted for the opportunity to be with you. Um, I do not believe that this election is a referendum on Donald Trump. I believe that we have made extraordinary progress in the 14th Congressional District here in my first term in Congress. Um, we have had the opportunity to work with the Trump administration in a bipartisan way to get three of my bills signed into law, including one to lower insulin prices. And so we have a lot of uh, important items that are really relevant to the 14th Congressional in a hyper-local way that we have um, in contrast between Mr. Oberweiss and I, and I think that that will dictate uh, who wins this election. It's not about Donald Trump and um, Joe Biden. Okay, very good. Senator Oberweiss? We found something we agree on. I don't think it's about the, uh, the president either. Uh, but quite frankly, uh, I think it's about the fact that uh, my opponent has uh, run two years ago like a moderate Democrat, but since then has voted like a radical socialist. Uh, she has refused to call for Mike Madigan's resignation, even though she said earlier last week that she wanted to help clean up corruption. And yet, she has a joint fundraising account with an account controlled by Mike Madigan. She's refused to call for Mike Madigan to step down, uh, even though obviously uh, there are federal investigations going on. Uh, she refused to call for Terry Link to step, to step down, one of my fellow state senators who happens to be the Democrat party chairman in Lake County. And she's refused to condemn the um, destroying of businesses, the looting and rioting that has gone on. Uh, and, and she refused to, uh, to defend the police in the situation. Certainly there have been some mistakes that have been made, no question about that. But uh, for heaven's sakes, to somehow imply that that's then okay to, to steal everything out of a, uh, a business who had nothing to do with that, that makes no sense whatsoever. Her views might be okay maybe in San Francisco. They aren't okay in the 14th Congressional District and that's why I'm running. She just does not represent her views or anything close to it. Uh, Representative Underwood, care to respond to that? Well, I think that, you know, my opponent has been using his time to lodge character attacks, and I've been spending my time as your representative focused on the issues and focused on serving this community. We've had 20 town halls in, um, in 2019. We've had a dozen uh, this year. Uh, we've set up nine constituent advisory committees and have really uh, taken the opportunity, I'm sorry, we had 15 town halls in 2019, let me be really precise, 15 town halls in 2019, a dozen this year, and taken the opportunity to hear directly from the constituents of this community. I set out at the very beginning of my term to be the most accessible, transparent, and responsive congresswoman that this community has ever seen, and we've certainly delivered on that. Lauren, if I could clarify something, you, you mentioned at the top of the interview that you work in a bipartisan manner and that three of your bills have been signed into law, which is something that you also said during the St. Charles Forum. Um, it's not 100% true, though, and, and I wanted to ask you about that. Three of your bills were adapted into other pieces of legislation that were signed into law by the president. Is that correct? Three of my pieces of legislation were signed into law. Um, as you know, in the United States Congress, individual members have the opportunity to draft pieces of legislation. And in fact, sometimes there are large bills. They, we call them omnibus bills. Sometimes they're appropriations bills. Uh, sometimes they're just 
conglomerates of ideas that get uh, moved through the legislative process. And so uh, I think that it's important to work in a collaborative way with my colleagues. But when we talk about legislation and original legislation, um, I'm really proud of our record of success. Very good, thank you. Um, may I comment on that too? You may, you may. Yeah, uh, look, my opponent has voted 100% of the time with Nancy Pelosi. We've asked for, just give us any single example where you disagree with Nancy, where you've not voted with Nancy. And I realize Nancy has raised an awful lot of money for my opponent. Uh, so maybe therefore she owes her loyalty, but her loyalty should be to the people of the 14th Congressional District, not to Nancy Pelosi. And you can't in any way pretend to be bipartisan if you vote 100% of the time with Nancy Pelosi. How about one last response from you, Representative Underwood, and then we'll move on. There are many areas that I do disagree with the Trump administration, but we found a way to work together in a collaborative, bipartisan way on issues important to this community, like immigration, like health care. Um, and so the three bills for folks who don't know, one is the Lower Insulin Cost Now Act, which makes generic insulin available on the marketplace sooner. Uh, the second is one to implement an electronic medical record. It's interoperable, so we no longer have children dying in federal custody along the U.S.-Mexico border. And the third was one in the COVID package uh, related to our reliance on the foreign medical supply chain, which is an incredibly important national security issue, particularly during a pandemic. I mean, when we face national crises, we do need to work together. And I think that uh, our record clearly demonstrates uh, my effectiveness in doing so. As, as Russell pointed out, these weren't the individual bills that were passed. They were incorporated into larger legislation that was in fact passed. But my question wasn't that. My question was, where have you disagreed with Nancy Pelosi? If you vote 100% of the time with Nancy Pelosi, uh, how can that possibly be bipartisan, for heaven's sake? She's about as partisan a person as in the entire Congress. Here's, here's a point where, where, I, where I remind you that we're not talking to each other. Um, we're talking over each other, OK? Uh, anyway, I, I think the question's been answered. So let's move on to another question. Uh, Senator Oberweiss, is there a systemic racism in the United States? Well, I guess that it depends entirely on how you uh, want to define that. It, it seems very clear that there certainly have been instances of that. Uh, no question about that in my mind. And I've tried to work very hard uh, personally uh, and professionally to overcome that. Uh, one of my very best friends is Pastor Corey Brooks in Chicago. This is just one incredible human being who grew up in Muncie, Indiana, moved to the worst parts of Chicago in order to try to help that community because it was one of the most violent parts in Chicago. Uh, 6620 South Martin Luther King Drive on the uh, border of uh, Woodlawn and Edgelawn, uh, uh, Englewood uh, neighborhoods. That guy does more to help people in this community than anybody I can possibly imagine. And I've tried to support him in every way that I can, including driving over white dairy milk trucks in to support the, uh, the food drives that he has had from time to time. So uh, are there instances of that? Yes, I don't think there's any question about that. We all have to work together to try to solve those problems. That's what I've done in my life. That's what I've tried to encourage my children and my grandchildren to do. And I'm very proud of the way our family has uh, been supportive of those types of efforts. Thank you. Uh, Representative Underwood. I certainly do think that the United States does have systemic racism throughout our country. We've had 400 years of a legacy of slavery in this country, and as a result, um, there are continued to be um, challenges that we have to overcome. Uh, this summer, we've seen our country have a national conversation about race and racism and white supremacy and Black Lives Matter. And I've been so pleased to see so many individuals kind of examine their own roles within these systems, uh, the companies and organizations that they're affiliated with, but also come together to uh, affirm that we want to have true equality and equity and justice for all. And I think that that is something that indicates that our country is moving in the right direction. 
Um, and I think that it's important when we talk about shared values here in this community that we affirm that we have diversity, uh, diverse perspectives, people's race and religion and country of origin and native language. And uh, if we're gonna be a welcoming community for everyone as we certainly espouse ourselves to be, then I think that it's incumbent on the community's representatives to uh, face the realities of systemic racism and other injustices head on. Okay. Thank you. John Stife. John Stife with uh, Shaw Media. Is there a need for police reform? If so, will it require an overhaul or merely tweaking? We'll start with you, Representative Underwood. Yes, I have been, again, uh, so pleased about, you know, the rallies and protests and calls to action, um, affirming in this way uh, a message of equity and justice. And uh, particularly after the murder of George Floyd, I do think that uh, the country was eager and hungry uh, for policing reform. These types of reforms that I've championed in the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, the bipartisan legislation that we passed in the House of Representatives in June, uh, has important reforms that will help our community here in the 14th Congressional District. We're talking about items like um, centering transparency and accountability uh, that would require um, body cameras that would ban chokeholds and carotid holds, that would require the use of legal, lethal force only in the extreme most necessary situations and require documentation and transparency around that use of lethal force. You know, reforming qualified immunity. All of these provisions have broad support here in our community and across the country. Um, and that's why I think that we were able to receive that kind of bipartisan support in the House of Representatives. Um, policing reform something that helps all of us. I think that there's been this ca uh, characterization that would suggest that um, it's just for you know certain urban communities or communities of color. Um, but even when I think about the 14th congressional district and the opportunities for improvement, particularly around body cameras, um, I think that uh, this type of legislation would be welcomed and warmly received. Senator Oberweiss. John, thanks for the question. I think it's, it's a great and uh, certainly important question. Um, I think that uh, we should all agree, regardless of politics or party, that uh, when we see something wrong, uh, demonstrating or protesting against that wrong is absolutely the right thing to do and should be supported by all of us. That shouldn't be a Republican or Democrat issue. I think we should universally agree on that. But I also think that we should universally agree that those mistakes that a few people make in no way uh, should lead to um, groups of people burning down businesses, destroying businesses, uh, uh, looting, rioting. Again, that should not be a political issue. Uh, Republicans and Democrats alike should certainly be agreeing that that is wrong and unacceptable. Uh, my opponent doesn't feel that way. I mean, she's talked about that as being a, a beautiful example of, uh, uh, of moving towards racial justice or something of that nature. That, 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 to me, that's just craziness. That doesn't fit with this district whatsoever. Um, when I first saw some of this looting going on in, in uh, Chicago on North Michigan Avenue uh, what, a month or two ago, I thought, wow, this is really crazy stuff. I sure hate to be a small business owner who just had my business totally destroyed. Um, but I called uh, Pastor Corey Brooks, my friend, and said, uh, you've seen that on TV. Thank goodness it doesn't happen in, in your neighborhood. And he said, absolutely, it's happening in our neighborhood. He said they literally broke into every single grocery store and every pharmacy in both of those neighborhoods. And, and the stores are closed and now people have no way to get fresh food. They have no way to get their prescriptions filled because many of those people in his area don't have a car. They're used to taking public transportation. Uh, and that's why he organized one of the first uh, uh, huge uh, giveaway events uh, where they actually provided vegetables and fruits and protein and, and a company donated uh, books so that 
uh, parents could could read those books to their kids who were obviously staying home because there was no school. And I drove an overweight dairy milk truck in there. I stood there for three and a half hours giving milk to those people who were in need. And there were two lines, one line of cars pulling up from station to station to get the different products. And one line of people walking down the street, pushing you know, grocery carts or wagons or whatever else they could to help get the food back home when they didn't have a car. Uh, it was a lot of work, it was a hard day, but boy, you know, I left coming home feeling we had really done something very positive. Uh, and uh, I think that's critical uh, that we respond in that way to help people, uh, that we understand that there are some mistakes made, that, and, and those policemen who make those types of mistakes need to be punished. Uh, I filed legislation in Springfield uh, requiring licensure of police officers because too often uh, in those cases where some of those uh, cops make mistakes, uh, the, even if they're bad guys who do it intentionally, uh, they're protected by their union and defended by their union. And even if they do eventually get fired, they can turn around and go get a job in, I don't know, you know, Kalamazoo or uh, Cincinnati or something different. Under my proposal uh, with licensure, uh, they would have to take additional step to uh, uh, stay licensed. And that provides an outside uh, governing body, if you want to call it that, or, or oversight, so that if people really do some of these bad things, they won't be able to maintain their license. They won't be able to go get a job in a different community. So I think that's the right thing. We've, we've got to root out whatever bad apples are in the barrel. But to try to then say that every cop or every policeman is somehow guilty uh, of association, I mean, th that's crazy. Uh, what we're doing is heading towards a society trying to, uh, I think my opponent and some on the uh, extreme side are, are trying to have us lose trust in our police staff, say that we're gonna start over, we're gonna fire every police and, and rebuild in a, in a different fashion. Uh, that to me is sheer insanity and uh, we just can't allow that to happen. That will lead unfortunately to something much worse and that's the uh, vigilantes uh, then saying, hey, police aren't gonna protect me, uh, I'm gonna protect me. Just, you know, that's kind of what happened I think in Kenosha and my gosh, that was an individual coming from Antioch who was in our district. We can't allow that stuff to happen. Representative Underwood, a few times he's brought up uh, uh, looting and whether you're for or against that or any response to that. Do you have, do you have any response in that realm? Well, uh, my response to what Mr. Oberweiss said is that he's uh, obviously spent a lot of time talking about Chicago. And the work that I've done has been really focused on the communities here in the 14th Congressional District and the reforms in the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which was your original question, uh, John, um, do respond to the requests for reforms coming from this community. And so I, I just wanna put a point in it that this was a bipartisan piece of legislation that the House has passed. It's not a proposal <laughs> that's gone nowhere. This is something uh, that has the broad support in the House and that we're hopeful that there is a path forward to get this signed into law this year. Um, with response to uh, some of the violence that we've seen after these protests, you know, we've seen um, significant violence, damage, injuries, and unfortunately deaths. You know, what happened in Kenosha uh, was heartbreaking. And this young man from our community, the fact that he was traveling across state lines with a weapon um, and you know, is something that should never happen. Um, and that's why I've been such a strong supporter of things like the assault weapons ban, um, because these weapons of war do not belong in our communities. Um, and no one should feel their life being threatened at work or at school, um, or even in a peaceful protest. There's no reason that weapons should be brought to protest. And I think that, um, you know, we obviously have a ways to go as a country when it comes to um, uniting together and, and folks having these important conversations. Um, but, you know, I want to be very clear that um, my comments on policing reform are in response to the requests that we've heard from people in the 14th district. Okay. Um, 
you just touched on something, Representative Underwood. Um, my next question, uh, Senator Oberweiss, is tell us your thoughts about gun control, including assault weapons. Well, uh, first of all, I, I certainly am a uh, supporter of the Second Amendment. I believe that that's part of our uh, uh, heritage, our history, our constitution, and I stand in support of that. Uh, but I think there are reasonable restrictions that can be applied to that. And uh, I have voted for some of those restrictions in Springfield. Uh, as I go to Washington, I will continue to evaluate those very carefully to uh, have a balance between protecting our Second Amendment rights and a balance for what is necessary to uh, keep our society safe. Uh, again, the worst situation that we can get to is where uh, we have vigilantes who want to go out and uh, feel that they have to defend their property that's something that should be left up to the professionals. That's why the police are there. They are trained. Maybe they need more training in some cases, uh, but I would support that. I support the training, uh, but uh, we have to be uh, uh, very forward looking and uh, avoid these situations where people are now gonna stand on their, their property with a gun and decide they have to protect their, their business or their home uh, from uh, uh, those who wanna do harm. and, and uh, you know, once again, I, I, I wish my opponent would just come right out and say, I absolutely will condemn the rioting and looting that's going on. But unfortunately, uh, Lauren and, and the squad, uh, all, those people just will not make that statement that this is absolutely wrong. Under no circumstances do you have the right to break into somebody else's uh, business and steal and loot whatever they have or uh, throw Molotov cocktails in and start fires to, uh, to burn down those businesses. This is just wrong. Uh, the people in my, you know, I've been going door to door and talking to people. This is becoming the number one issue. They're concerned about their future. They're concerned about their community. They're concerned about what is happening to their police departments. And uh, if my opponent hasn't uh, uh, talked to people, if she hasn't been out knocking on any doors, uh, you know, just having a few uh, seminars, uh, uh, you know, by uh, Zoom, uh, that doesn't do the job. You don't get to feel what people are really believing. And I, I've done uh, tele, uh, town halls, several of them myself also. They're great. They can be informative. But you don't get that feedback where people are really concerned about what's happening to our country and to our own district. Okay. Uh, Senator, the, um, what specifically are your thoughts about assault weapons? There is no good definition of assault weapon. And, you know, we've gone around and around this. Certainly, uh, we have to be very, very careful and very concerned. Uh, I, as I said earlier, I do uh, accept reasonable restrictions on those, uh, but nobody's been able to ever give me a good definition of what you mean by an assault weapon. Well, let's talk about the AR-15. Does that have a place in American society? Isn't that one of the most common uh, weapons that is used for competition, uh, for uh, uh, even in some cases for hunting? Okay, leave it at that. Um, Representative Underwood, uh, to his point, you didn't really say whether you uh, condemn acts of violence and looting. Here's your opportunity if you'd like to take it. Yes, as I said before, Jim, I think it's really important that we continue to lift up the peaceful protesters, um, those who um, are exercising their First Amendment rights, but it is a tragedy when people are injured, when there's violence, when there's damage, uh, and the like as a result of these uh, types of demonstrations, and um, that, that it's not appropriate. Okay, thank you. Um, Representative Underwood, how would you rate the federal government's response to COVID-19? Um, I think that it has been extraordinarily poor. The president has um, summed it up himself when he said, I take no responsibility at all. And as a result, um, here we are with nearly 190,000 Americans dead, 6 million Americans diagnosed. Um, you know, we continue to lack personal protective equipment for our essential and frontline healthcare workers. Um, the American people are seeking COVID tests and ex are still experiencing delays. 
seven, 10 days without getting results back timely. We don't have free COVID treatment. We've seen that, um, you know, there's been continued undermining of states as they've been forced to compete with one another for essential supplies. And all of this is happening um, while the economy has fallen into a recession. And so I think that this lack of leadership coming out of the White House, uh, their unwillingness to put forward a national plan to help our country recover from COVID-19 has been um, something that has been an extraordinary failure and um, has really hurt the American people and communities like ours. Even today, there's been news that's broken uh, to suggest that the president intentionally uh, misled the American people about his knowledge of how, um, how severe COVID-19 could be among the American people, the type of severe illness that folks could present with. And that's just inappropriate. That's not real leadership. And when we think about uh, a time when we have a once in a century pandemic, we need leaders in this country who are going to step forward, center the science and the facts, um, and speak to the American people in a way that will give them not just comfort, but an understanding of the actions that they can take to protect themselves and their families. And so now, what are we? We're in the 14th district. We're battling two crises: a healthcare crisis and an economic crisis um, that you know will continue on for the foreseeable future. In my role in the Congress, we have been focused on delivering COVID relief packages. Early in the spring, we passed a series of COVID relief packages in March and in April. And May May 15th, we passed the HEROES Act, a comprehensive piece of COVID relief legislation that helps address the health care issues, the individual economic issues that families are facing, folks who can't pay their rent or can't pay their mortgage, families who are going hungry, um, and does support our small businesses to make sure that our economy can continue forward as employers. Um, and, you know, I have been so extremely dismayed at this partisanship that we've seen come out of the United States Senate, the president's representatives who have been unwilling to make a deal and negotiate. Um, and, you know, I am hopeful that as we return to Washington this weekend, we will be able to pass some additional COVID legislation to offer much lenient relief to the American people. Thank you. Senator Oberweiss. Jim, I've been very distressed by the extreme partisanship that's come out of the House, for heaven's sakes. Uh, they have taken this, uh, this uh, situation and tried to capture uh, federal dollars for all kinds of pet projects that have nothing to do with this pandemic. And I think that's just fundamentally wrong. Uh, just, you know, the, the politicization of, of this is, is very stressing. Uh, for heaven's sakes, uh, the president was very early in recognizing the problem and in terminating uh, air travel from China. Uh, and when he did that, he was criticized by Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats as overreacting to the situation. Uh, you know, I think hindsight shows that he was absolutely uh, uh, right in doing that and probably saved many American lives and, and reduced some of the early stress from that. Now, Having said that, I, I, want, I want you to know that I, I try to be fair uh, in discussing these things. I don't give him, certainly don't give him an A on this. Um, I think he was way too late to uh, recognize the importance of people wearing uh, face coverings or masks when they're indoors and in close contact with other people. Uh, that's something that we have required at Overweiss Dairy. Uh, that's something that I've tried to follow indoors and not necessarily outdoors. I think the evidence is that when you're outdoors and you're, you're a little distant from people, uh, the, the danger is, is pretty minor. But uh, it, it's, it's, it's another issue that shouldn't be a Republican issue or a Democrat issue. It, 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 it shouldn't, shouldn't be brought into politics. It should be a healthcare issue. We should all be working together to find the best solutions that we possibly can. And uh, when the, the voters in the 14th Congressional District send me to Washington, I will maintain that bipartisanship. I'll work across the aisle, as I have done for the last eight years in Springfield. Uh, and on numerous occasions, I've stood on the floor of the Illinois Senate 
asking my colleagues to please vote yes on a bill if they think it's a good bill or vote no if they think it's a bad bill, regardless of whether it's filed by and sponsored by a Republican or a Democrat. That shouldn't be the deciding point. And unfortunately, too often it is. We should be trying to make decisions on what is good for our, our district, what's good for our state, and also what's good for our country. And I pledge to you right now, that is exactly the attitude that I will take to Washington, D.C., and I will continue to follow it as long as I'm there. And by the way, uh, I don't intend to be there forever. I'm a big believer in term limits. This was my eighth and final year serving in the Illinois Senate. I actually thought <laughs> this winter I was going to have an opportunity to spend more time with my 24 grandkids. But uh, when my opponent started voting like a radical socialist, uh, people ask us to, uh, to get involved. And I'm 100 percent focused on making sure that, that our district has representation in Washington who understands what it takes to encourage business people and entrepreneurs to risk their time and their energy and their capital to create jobs and opportunities for other people. And that's what I've done my, for my whole life. So I understand that. Uh, my opponent has never been in the private sector, has never run a business, never had to balance a budget. And it's easy to say, oh, just spend more money. It's just taxpayers' money. Hey, let's do this and, and we'll provide more dollars for everything. Unfortunately, um, there is going to be a price to pay for that. And I'm concerned about the, the uh, trillions of dollars that we've already spent. And it, it certainly looks like there's going to be another trillion spent, uh, if not more. Uh, so. You know, my background is in financial services. I started a family of mutual funds. I, I ran a, a fund myself uh, for, for more than 20 years. And I know that when we flood the markets with this kind of cash, uh, historically that has led to more inflation at some point down the road and more inflation will lead to higher interest rates. When those interest rates start going up and our country has 26, 27, 28 trillion dollars in debt, the interest alone on those funds is going to put real pressure on the economy. That's something I'm very concerned about. Okay. Uh, John, did you have another question? Yeah, uh, Representative Underwood, just a follow up to that. What are your thoughts on mask wearing and do you feel like it differs at all from your opponent? So the science and the evidence and most importantly, the Centers for Disease Control and prevention recommendations are very clear, which is the American people should wear masks when they are not at home and interacting with anyone who is not from their household, period. Okay. Um, Representative Underwood, President Trump suggested that if Joe Biden were elected president, the, the suburbs would be imperiled. Um, what's your response to that? We've seen the president try to take all type of divisive tax, um, try to divide us, uh, try to make us fear our neighbors um, because he believes that that helps his reelection campaign. Um, but what I know about this community is this, when our neighbors get sick, we organize a meal train. Um, when someone is away, we pick up their mail um, and I believe that our community is one that is welcoming. <laughs> our community is one that is resilient. And our community is one that is, continues to grow. When I think of our state of Illinois, the 14th Congressional District are home to the counties that are growing. Um, and so I think that um, the president is wrong in this instance. I think that it really is a shame that he's seeking to stoke fear in this kind of really divisive way. And um, I think that has no place in our politics. I also just wanted to respond to something that I've been hearing over and over, if I may. Um, and that is my opponent is trying to paint me as some kind of a radical. And um, my record is really clear that we have worked effectively with the president's administration to get three bipartisan bills signed into law. Thank you. Okay. Very good, thank you. Um, Senator Oberweiss. I think the record is very clear, 100% with Nancy Pelosi. That is uh, what I think 
can be well defined as a radical socialism, no question about that. Uh, there's no bipartisanship when you vote 100% with Nancy Pelosi, that, that, that certainly doesn't fit. And I think the question was, would suburbs be in danger if Joe Biden is elected? And I would have to broaden that. I don't think it's just the suburbs. I think the entire country will be in trouble. Uh, look, uh, <laughs> until this pandemic hit, we had the strongest economy we've ever had. We had the lowest unemployment rates for, uh, for women, the lowest unemployment rates for African-Americans, the lowest unemployment rate for Latinos, uh, the lowest unemployment rate for the entire country. The economy was humming wrong because the president was doing the right things by reducing regulations, uh, keeping tax rates uh, competitive with the rest of the uh, world, and, and doing very good things to, to create more jobs and uh, opportunities for people. That's what will be gone. Uh, Mr. Biden has already said the first thing he's going to do is increase taxes. How is that going to help create jobs for people? How is that going to help bring our economy back? I mean, this, this, uh, this is unbelievable. It's not going to just hurt the 14th Congressional District. It's going to hurt the entire country. Uh, so I think that could be uh, very, very dangerous. And, I, and I've, lived, I've lived in the Aurora area for my entire life. I've lived in the Fox Valley area. Uh, in fact, I've lived in my same house for the last 42 years. I think I know uh, what is important to the people in the 14th Congressional District. And believe me, it's not the views of Nancy Pelosi. Um, if I could just uh, follow up, uh, Mr. Oberweiss, uh, John Lampkin, Daily Herald. Um, when uh, the president made the remarks, he pretty clearly was talking about, and I'd like both of your opinions on this, pretty clearly talking about affordable housing. And in fact, I think at some point he said, you know, uh, you know, that would let the you know poor people move in. Uh, so two questions: What is your position about you know affordable housing? Uh, you know, uh, reducing uh, the restriction, the zoning restrictions, and second. Was there a, uh, a dog whistle in, uh, in uh, what he was saying? Uh, is there a racial undertone to what he was saying? I'd like to hear what you have to say, Mr. Oberweiss, and then uh, Representative Underwood. To the last part, not to my knowledge, but I will tell you that uh, I have uh, recently toured several um, affordable housing projects that are uh, a perfect example of the government working with the private sector. Uh, these are not uh, my father's affordable housing units. These are very nice units uh, where uh, people pay a limited amount based on, on their income, but they're, they're new units. Uh, I just visited one in Patavia uh, probably a month or two ago. Uh, there was something that, uh, that I, I would be pleased to see my kids living in. They're, they're very nice apartments. Uh, so uh, I, I think this is a good example of how the government can work with uh, the private sector. The government, you know, when you, when you think of private housing, I think of Cabrini Green in Chicago or, or some of these very challenged uh, situations. And, and even in Aurora, we had some uh, public housing that was, was certainly uh, not nearly as nice as what we're, we're seeing uh, uh, going up right now. So uh, i firmly believe that, uh, that we're taking steps in the right direction and certainly reducing regulations uh, in most cases is something that I would tend to uh, lean up. Certainly some level of regulation is, is necessary. Uh, we, we certainly recognize that, but, but I think the government has gone uh, for the most part way too far. And I think the president's comments or idea that, you know, for every new regulation, I wanna eliminate two or three or four of the old ones. Uh, Boy, uh, that speaks to my heart, I'll tell you that. Shall I respond? Okay. Um, unfortunately, I think we just heard the same dog whistle coming from Mr. Overwise as we did in Mr. Trump's original comment. Um, second thing is with respect to affordable housing, we do have a number of affordable housing units across the 14th district, but not nearly enough. I've attended ribbon cuttings in McHenry and visited uh, new complexes as they are built across this district. Huntley has some uh, 
Batavia and in the Fox Valley area has some. And I've even talked with some of the reporters from your own publications who have um, shared with me their concerns about the lack of affordable housing units in our community. This is something uh, that is incredibly important. Uh, the federal tax credits are uh, a project that continues to allow um, some of those to be built in our community. And I think that the president's remarks um, obviously do not reflect the values of the 14th Congressional District. Okay. John Etheridge, you yes, had a question. Uh, John Etheridge with Shaw Media. Uh, Representative Underwood, what is your position on mail-in voting? I think it's really important that the American people continue to have um, opportunities to participate safely in this election. Here in Illinois, we have had the opportunity to vote at home, uh, even prior to 2020 and COVID-19. Uh, but I was very pleased to see Governor Pritzker expand access to vote by mail ahead of this election. I have been so dismayed. Um, by the recent policy changes put forth of the United States Postal Service, uh, which have really decreased the American people's confidence in the reliable, timely service. Uh, and we've seen uh, the new Postmaster General, uh, Mr. DeJoy, take actions to take machines offline, limited uh, staff, um, and certainly staff overtime, uh, which has really impacted the service and delivery uh, and reliability that we have come to count on in an agency that employs the most veterans in this country. Um, we have 80% of veterans who get their prescription drugs from the mail. And so, you know, playing partisan politics in a time of an election is something that is simply un-American in my point of view. Um, and so that's why I have uh, been so pleased to champion a piece of legislation called the Delivering for America Act. I returned to Washington in August to vote on that legislation. And it does two things. One is it offers $25 billion um, to meet the funding needs requested by President Trump's appointed board of governors. They came to the Congress and said, as a result of the pandemic, they needed some additional funds. And we put it in the HEROES Act, and we also voted on uh, that appropriation in the standalone bill, and then also uh, restores the service delivery standards uh, to what they were on January 1st, 2020, uh, when the American people continue to have full confidence in the United States Postal Service. But to directly summarize and answer your question, yes, um, I support vote from home. I think it is uh, the safe and reliable way uh, for people to be able to participate in this election. Uh, Senator Oberweiss, what is your position on mail-in voting? Thanks, John. Um, I believe that uh, uh, this, again, shouldn't be a political issue. Uh, certainly in this pandemic, it makes all kinds of sense uh, to keep people safe. Uh, in fact, uh, it, it has become a bit of a political issue uh, because, at least in Springfield, uh, some of the Democrats were uh, not willing to listen to I think common sense suggestions. For instance, on the floor of the Senate, uh, I proposed let's not just mail ballots, uh, mail and ballot applications, sorry, mail and ballot applications to uh, those who voted in 2018. Let's mail them to all registered voters in the state of Illinois. And by the way, we can do that at no postal cost to uh, uh, people in this district by including it with the uh, uh, constitutional amendment. We're required to mail out the information on the constitutional amendment to every registered voter. So why not just include the mail-in ballot application with that, which literally would save millions of dollars across the state of Illinois. But they refused to listen to that suggestion, uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, on a political basis, because they knew that um, Republican voting was strong in 2016, but not as strong in 2018. So they were concerned about getting it out to uh, to those uh, higher percentage Democrat votes. And it, it, to me, that's just wrong. If we really believe this is going to uh, make people safer, and I do, why not let everybody participate for heaven's sakes? Why try to limit it to give an advantage to Democrats? That, that, that just seems totally partisan and, and totally uh, unfair and, and shouldn't have happened. But it did. That's the legislation that, that ultimately passed, and that's what you get when you have a legislature that is so totally controlled
by one power or one party as we have in Illinois. It's a shame, uh, but uh, you'd think that voters across the state would start to get the idea that, that maybe a total dominant power by one party is not the best thing and would work on uh, uh, trying to uh, reduce Mr. Madigan's influence. Uh, it, you know, we could, we could go on and on about Mr. Madigan, but uh, uh, clearly uh, this guy has been abusive of power and controlled the, uh, particularly the House, but, but even to a degree the Senate. And uh, uh, that has certainly not been good for the state of Illinois. Uh, when we go to the question about the Postal Service, uh, I, it's my understanding that all of the uh, restrictions that uh, my opponent was talking about have been totally put on hold or stopped until after the election. Now, when we get past the election, uh, here we have a postal service that, that is operating at continuing deficits. We need to find ways to use more business, common sense practices to um, prevent those large deficits that have been occurring. And we can debate and talk about what the best ways to solve that are uh, after the election. But clearly, uh, up until the election, no changes are being made. So uh, we can, I think, rely on the Postal Service to uh, continue to deliver uh, help. And I, as I said, I do support mail-in ballots, particularly in this pandemic uh, situation that we're in today. I think you're muted, Jim. I broke my own rule. Sorry about that. Um, Senator Oberweiss, believe it or not, the Affordable Care Act has been around for more than 10 years now, 10 years and a few months. Uh, what's your assessment of it today and what can or should be done to, uh, to improve upon it? Jim, uh, unfortunately, I, I believe that uh, too many people on the other side of the aisle are, are trying to find ways to go to a single payer system where it's totally controlled by the government. I don't think that's good for citizens of this country or people in our district. Uh, I believe that there are things that we can do. Uh, first of all, we ought to provide more transparency. People ought to know what these services cost. Uh, and secondly, uh, we need to have more competition to help bring down prices. Uh, some of the things that the president is doing, like now allowing the reimportation of American-made drugs from Canada uh, is exactly the right thing uh, because so far, uh, we American citizens have, in effect, been required to pay all the R&D costs for the many drug discoveries that we have in this country. And this country has been very productive. More than 50% of all drugs discovered in the entire world are discovered right here in the United States. Uh, I don't want to stop that, that, e that effective way to find new ways to make people's lives better. But I think that those who benefit from those drugs ought to share equally in the costs. And what has happened is drug companies have sold to the one Canadian buyer, the government, at a lower price than uh, they've sold to uh, uh, American suppliers. And I think that's fundamentally wrong. If you eliminate the uh, barrier, uh, then Americans could buy their prescriptions from a CVS in Toronto, for example, uh, and uh, equalize those prices pretty quickly. So that would clearly be a step in the right direction. I will tell you also that in Springfield, I introduced legislation, uh, which was the right to shop for elective surgery. And under that bill, uh, it would have required uh, insurance companies to post on their website the average in-network price for certain elective surgeries, like uh, let's say a hip replacement or a knee replacement. It would then have allowed uh, uh, potential patients to shop if they wish to, purely voluntary, but if they wish to, they could look around and if they found a provider, who would provide that service at a price lower than the average in-network price, they could go out of network, the insurance company would pay, and they would get to keep half of the savings. More competition, good idea. And the insurance company would get to keep the other half. I mean, that seems like a win-win. And you'd think that that would just be something that would be immediately uh, uh, obvious to most people. And in fact, it was. I worked on a bipartisan basis and we ended up, if I remember correctly, I think with 17 Republican sponsors and 18 Democrat sponsors, that's 35 votes. It takes only 30 votes to pass legislation in the Illinois Senate because there are 59. Do you think this passed even though it had 35 sponsors? Answer, not in Illinois because the 
leadership has too much power. They can prevent such a bill from being heard in committee, even when you have enough sponsors on a bill to pass it with just the sponsors, not the other people voting for it. That's a shame. And that's what we get from Mike Madigan. That's the way he's run this, this uh, state for way too many years and run it into the ground and created 137 billion unfunded liability, creating a situation where Commonwealth Edison has paid $200 million to settle claims of bribery to uh, Mike Madigan's friends. And, and the, Illinois used to be such a great state. I was so proud to be from Illinois. We got great advantages. Some of the best farmland in the world were the number one soybean producer, the number two corn producer. Great transportation hub from trains to, to uh, 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 you know, the Great Lakes to uh, uh, our uh, expressways that go through the state of Illinois to one of the best and busiest airports in the world to some of the best universities. I mean, the University of Illinois, University of Chicago, Northwestern are, are internationally renowned, incredible institutions. And yet the politicians have destroyed the state so badly that sometimes I'm almost embarrassed to say I'm, I'm from Illinois when I meet people from other states. It shouldn't be that way. Great advantages. It's the politicians that have made this a mess. You kind of sound like you're running for state senate again, sir. Not at all. Uh, I'm, okay. I'm done with my eighth and final year. I believe in term limits. All right. Very good. Uh, Representative Underwood. Well, I'm a nurse and I believe that healthcare is a human right. And in Congress, I've been focused on protecting coverage for people with pre-existing conditions. We've been working to lower uh, the cost of prescription drugs and increasing access to affordable, high quality healthcare, including maternal healthcare, mental healthcare, and reproductive healthcare. Meanwhile, the Trump administration has been in court suing to dismantle the Affordable Care Act and the protections that the law provides during a pandemic. And if that lawsuit's successful, 20 million Americans will lose the health care coverage that they count on. I passed an amendment to make sure that no federal dollars could be used to support that outrageous undertaking. But I didn't stop there. I have been introducing original bills and pieces of legislation, including our Lower Insulin Cost Now Act that we discussed earlier. Um, that was signed into law by President Trump. Uh, I passed the Health Care Affordability Act, the bill that says that no Americans would pay more than eight and a half percent of their adjusted gross income on premiums. And that was adopted in um, the Affordable Care Enhancement Act that the House passed on a bipartisan basis in June. Um, I should also add, by the way, that my amendment about not um, paying for this outrageous lawsuit passed the House in a bipartisan way <laughs> this summer. So just so that we're very clear on my bipartisan record of achievement, um, we were able to pass legislation to lower prescription drug prices and allow Medicare to negotiate those drug prices. Um, I passed legislation unanimously out of the House of Representatives on mental health care. It's called the Veterans Care Quality and Transparency Act. Um, and so, you know, we know that healthcare is an important issue on the minds of voters here in the 14th Congressional District. Um, and we've heard Senator Oberweiss say that he supports protections for people with pre-existing conditions. Um, and we've heard that same line from our former Republican congressman. But the truth is that the legislation that Mr. Oberweiss supports uh, would not provide those protections. And we even had a contrast piece published in one of your papers, the Northwest Herald, uh, outlining the differences in our healthcare approaches. And they came, the reporter came to the same conclusion. As a nurse, I know that reproductive healthcare is healthcare. And I find Senator Overweis's on the record statements supporting limiting access to birth control, banning a woman's right to choose, and outlawing abortion, even in cases of rape, to be very disturbing. His views, frankly, are radical and they are out of touch with the people in our community. Uh, so, Senator Orbeis, uh, um, first, I'm sure you want to rebut that. Uh, yes. Second, do you also, do you also believe that health care is a human right? Uh, look, uh, I do believe in the right to life uh, and my opponent uh, supports absolute unlimited abortion at any time. And I think that's fundamentally wrong and not in line with people in this district. And she talked about being uh, uh, bipartisan. 
uh, look, uh, she has been rated 344th out of 435 congressmen for uh, uh, lack of partisanship, uh, uh, lack of being bipartisan. She's one of the most uh, partisan members of the entire Congress. So to sit there and tell people that she's bipartisan, that's an insult to the intelligence of people who are listening to that. That's just not right. And that, that kind of stuff shouldn't happen. Uh, the numbers and the facts are there. Uh, when she talks about having three bills signed, uh, for heaven's sakes, those obviously uh, were incorporated into other bills, as I think uh, Russell had mentioned uh, uh, way back at the beginning of this discussion. Uh, and when you control uh, uh, a part of the legislature, as the Democrats do the House, uh, she should be able to get every single bill that she ever proposed through the House, at least. And I believe she had proposed, I think, something like 28 bills, and uh, uh, only a very few of those even passed her own party in the House. Um, and again, when you talk about partisanship, nobody can claim to be bipartisan if they vote 100% of the time with Nancy Pelosi. Uh, so uh, look, this is just, uh, you know, it, this doesn't make sense. It's not acceptable. John, you have a final question for us? Uh, yes, I guess I would uh, go to uh, Mr. Oberweiss and then uh, a Representative Underwood. Uh, 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 Senator, I uh, want to give you both the chance to uh, make your case for uh, you know, in a minute or so, your case for why uh, people should vote for you over your opponent. Did, did you want me first, did you say? Yes, Senator Overwise. Yeah, uh, look, uh, I've lived in this district for 42 years. I understand the needs of this district. I understand what it takes to encourage people to create jobs and opportunities. Uh, after my brother had a stroke, uh, I bought Overwise Dairy from him. Uh, and since that time, we've grown it from 50 uh, employees to well over 1,200 employees. Uh, I've spent my entire career in the private sector creating jobs and opportunities for people. Uh, my opponent has never done that. She doesn't have that experience. Uh, she may be a very nice person, but she just doesn't have the experience that is so necessary to represent the views of this district in Washington. Uh, it, it's not fair to say that uh, she can vote 100% of the time with Nancy Pelosi and therefore uh, represent the views of people in the 14th Congressional District because those two are, are not compatible. It, it doesn't make any sense. So I think it's critical that we have people with experience. Uh, and uh, that is really what, uh, what I've done. I, I think uh, I have a quote here, if I can read it. Uh, I believe it was from Cicero. And uh, if it were not for the elders correcting the mistakes of the young, there would be no state. I've got that experience. And, and I'm, as Ronald Reagan said, I want to try not to hold my uh, uh, opponent's uh, youth and uh, lack of experience against her. But, but there's no substituting for having many years of experience in the private sector and understanding what it takes to, uh, uh, to help grow this economy. And that's where my strength is. Well, I want to thank the editorial boards for having me today. I think the voters have a really clear choice in this race. I'm focused on listening to the challenges people are fa facing here in our community in Northern Illinois and focus on getting results for our community. My opponent's statements today show just how out of touch he is with our community. Mr. Overweiss has used his time uh, to distort and attack my record today. He's talked about his volunteer work in Chicago, and I've heard so very few policy proposals. Our community has a clear choice. I mean, I focus on getting results for people in the 14th District, high quality health care, um, protecting our community from COVID-19. I'm proud to say that my team and I have been really effective over the past year and a half whether it's securing free COVID testing for people, uh, making lower cost generic insulin available sooner to families who need it, and standing up for our farmers during the trade war with China. Since being sworn into Congress, I voted to support federal programs that have brought over a billion dollars into the 14th district to fund small business loans, cutting edge science at Fermilab, and other grants and federal contracts that support good jobs and services in our community. 
To me, the most important part of my job in Congress is bringing the voices and the values of Northern Illinois to Congress. And when I think about the values that our community holds dear, I think about the relationships that we have with our neighbors. And I think that a lot of your questions really spoke to that today. We look out for one another in our community and we refuse to give in to the cynical politics that would have us regard our neighbors with fear and suspicion. I think that the biggest difference between my opponent and I is that I want to bring our community together. I want to provide the resources that our families need during this crisis, and I want to ensure that all of our families have access to the high quality health care that they need to survive COVID-19 if they get diagnosed. Okay, I want every single family in our community to have access to the paid family leave that they need so no one has to choose between getting a paycheck and caring for a sick child. Those are the values that I bring to Congress. Those are the values that I was raised with here in Northern Illinois. And it has been an honor, the honor of my life to represent this community in Congress. I thank you again for having me and for creating a space for this conversation. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Uh, this concludes today's interview. I wanna thank both uh, Representative Underwood and Senator Oberweiss for their time and participation. Good luck to both of you on your campaigns. Uh, the election's November 3rd, but early voting, including mail-in voting, begins around September 24th. Uh, we encourage all voters to research the candidates and issue in all the races and to make uh, good use of the Daily Herald and dailyherald.com, as well as Shaw Media's various publications and websites as part of that research. Ultimately, voting is one of the most sacred obligations a citizen has if a democracy is to flourish and we encourage you to vote. Thank you for all watching and stay well. Thanks.